Hey there. You know as a referee, your rule book is your best friend. But you can know it from front to back and still have no idea what to do in an actual game. This DVD will help you in developing your floor mechanics, so you feel more confident and comfortable while refing. That way, rather than worrying about what you're doing, you can focus on the game and start having fun, all while doing a better job. Remember, the amount of time you invest off the court is reflected in the quality of your work on the court. The more you know, the easier your job becomes. Hey you, I saw that! A normal basketball court is 94 feet long. That's a lot of ground to cover, and that's why there are rules on how to do it. In a two-referee system, one ref is the trail and the other ref is the lead. The lead is the ref closest to the basket that the offense is trying to score on. The trail is the other guy. The trail should normally be moving to stay left of the plane above the free throw line. The lead on the other side of the court roams from the far side of the key to the three-point line. You should always keep moving, but move with a purpose, to get a better view into boxing the players between you and your partner. When the ball starts moving the other way, the lead becomes the trail and vice versa. But what happens at the start of the game? Who goes where? Here the official not administering the jump ball runs in the direction of the play to assume the lead position, while his partner waits for the players to pass before going to the trail position. Look at the spacing between the referees and how they box in the play, even in transition. If the ball's moving, you probably should be too. Always put yourself in position to be on top of the play. Remember, always move with a purpose and always be aware of where your partner is. Done correctly, these guidelines ensure that you and your partner are covering the game efficiently and that one of you will be in the right place at the right time to make the right call. The most valuable asset you have while refing is your partner, because you can't possibly see everything on the court. Your partner is your second set of eyes, and if you work together and stick to your areas of responsibility, you can cover the entire court with ease. If the ball is not in your zone, you're responsible for all off-ball coverage. You must, however, always know where the ball is without actually watching it. You should also be aware of where your partner is so you can use the box in principle, keeping all ten players between you and your partner. This involves moving around a lot. If you make a call in your partner's area of responsibility, you're not only saying that you don't trust your partner, but you're also showing that you're not watching your own area. Let's examine this post-play scenario in the lead's area of responsibility. From the trail position, it looks as if the black player fouls the gray player. But, if we take a look at the play from the lead's point of view, you can clearly see there is no infraction on the play. Unless you're 200% sure your partner missed something, it's best you don't stray from your area of responsibility. And finally, remember to trust and communicate with your partner. It'll make both your jobs a lot easier and more enjoyable. Part of being a referee is looking professional at all times, which means you have to look like you know what you're doing so people can have confidence that you do, in fact, know what you're doing. All too often, referees look lost during dead ball situations, especially during timeouts, because they simply don't know the correct procedure. Let's go over it, shall we? To grant the request, the referee closest to the scorer's table blows his whistle and makes the timeout signal. He then points to where the ball will be coming in and then lets the scorers know which team called the timeout. All timeouts are one minute long. If you need to talk to your partner, do it now. If not, you should both run to the far edge of the foul line so that you're both facing a team's bench. Whoever has the ball should hold it in their hand or place it in front of them on the floor. This is a good time to do a quick game analysis. When there are 10 seconds left in the timeout, the horn should sound and the referee should blow his whistle to call the teams back. You and your partner should run back to your original position, ready to start play as soon as the 60 seconds are up. Always remember, a timeout doesn't mean break time. Don't walk around aimlessly or bounce the ball around. Be professional. If you follow the proper procedures, your game will run smoother. And you'll look smoother, too. As a referee, your most important job is to ensure the smooth running of the game. You do this by enforcing the rules, by calling violations and fouls. But calling them isn't enough. You have to make sure what you're calling is clear to everyone. That's why there's procedures for how to do it. Let's start with a violation call. First, you blow your whistle and let everyone know you have a call. Come on, blow the whistle. Make me believe it. Good. While you're doing this, lift up your arm with a flat, open hand. This gesture shows you have a violation. Next, make the signal for the infraction so everyone knows what you're calling. 
a separate section of the DVD explains the signals for each infraction. Finally, point to the area out of bounds closest to where the violation happened, to let everyone know where the ball will be coming in. It's as simple as that. Now let's see some in-game examples. Marie sees an offensive player who's been in the key for too long and has a direct impact on the play. Three. Marie's One hand ball. went up with the whistle, she signaled the violation and direction of the ball, and where it should be coming in. Here, the black player knocks the ball out of bounds. Hand, whistle, direction. The other type of call you'll make is a foul. It starts off just like a violation call. When you see the foul, blow your whistle and lift your arm. This time, however, make a fist, which lets everyone know you have a foul. Next, make a signal to show what kind of foul you have. Next, if the foul happened on the ground, point to the nearest point out of bounds to let everyone know where the ball will be coming in. If the foul occurred during a shot that was missed, raise two fingers and say, two shots. If the shot was made, swing your arm down to let everyone know that the basket counts, and then indicate one shot. Run over to the reporting area and say you have a foul. Tell the scorekeeper who the foul was on, their jersey color, and what type of foul it was. Foul. 2-3 blue. Illegal use. If you need to shoot any foul shots, let them know. Shooting two. Then run over to where you should be. Oh yeah, that. When you call a foul, you and your partner should switch positions. So, if you were on the baseline when you called the foul, after you're done reporting, you should go to the trail position, and vice versa. Let's see this in action. Look closely. See the foul? Gary does, and he lets everyone know it by blowing his whistle with a fist stop and signaling, count the basket, plus one shot. He runs to the reporting area and tells the scorekeeper, then he gets in position to shoot some free throws. Here's a play from a referee's point of view. Marie hands the ball in, it's intercepted, and then stolen. Marie calls a shooting foul and goes to report it. Now if she'd only kicked that coach off the court while she was over there, oh well, great call though. Check out Gary. He's already made the call and he's coming to report it. Watch how Nick waits for him to finish reporting before handing him the ball. Great communication. That's how you do it. So to recap, for a violation, blow your whistle, raise your arm with an open hand, signal the type of violation, and point to where the ball will be coming in. For a foul, blow your whistle, raise your arm with a fist, Signal the type of foul, indicate where the ball will be coming in or the number of shots to be taken, run to the reporting area, tell the scorekeeper the fouler's number and jersey color as well as the type of foul and if you will be shooting free throws. And finally, remember to switch positions with your partner. Practice these procedures at home. Do them with authority so that when you make a call during the game, your partner, the coaches, the scorekeepers, and every single fan knows exactly what you're calling. Just don't expect them to always agree with you though.